All right, let's, let's take our Bibles and uh, we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> let's stand together as we read out of respect to God and His Word. I was telling the brother I was talking to here uh, this morning, tell me your name again. John, I was talking to John here. As a pastor... One of the things that in, in the early, the, after a first one year of getting saved, I, you know, I didn't have a real relationship with God. Although I was saved, I went after my Christian life the same way I went after my, you know, being the best baseball player kind of thing. Doer mentality. But you know, after the first year, I was wore out. And I thought, maybe there, there's something, there's got to be more to this than this. And so uh, I got to the point where I realized that I really needed help and I asked God to show me. And uh, how to have a daily time with God here on the book table was what came out of that. But how to, how to have God's message for you today, how to let God work in your life, how to let Him show you what you have need of, and actually looking at the Bible with a purpose and studying it with a purpose. So as a pastor, a pastor for 42 years, I taught through the New Testament verse by verse, word by word, phrase by phrase, multiple times. First time through, it took me three and a half years to get through the book of Revelation. But we did that on Wednesday night, and many times our Wednesday night attendance was as high or even higher than our morning attendance, and our morning attendance was good because people wanted to be able to understand what God's Word said, and words are important, by the way, and their definitions are important. So I praise God for that being able to teach through the New Testament multiple times, word by word, phrase by phrase, with the Holy Spirit teaching us. And that's important. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to talk to you this morning about communication. And communication is a very important tool in marriage. And again, keeping in mind that it's about being a saved person but a spirit-controlled person. The definition biblically of a godly marriage is two saved, spirit-controlled people. It's not two lost people. It's not a lost person, a saved person. It's not two Christians that are doer mentality Christians. It's two saved, spirit-controlled people. Otherwise, we're going to have major malfunctions. The Bible says here in Ephesians chapter 4, and look at verse 14 with me. It says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in what, folks? Love may grow up in him, unto him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Over in verse 29 it says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying or building up, that it may minister grace or divine help unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Thank you. You may be seated. In all my years of pastoral ministry, I have observed and counseled people about their marriage. And through the counseling center and the previous ministry to that, for the love of the family, I, we received many contacts every month, each month from around the world. And uh, pastors and their wives who are struggling in their marriages, uh, there are six points that the Bible brings out ladies and gentlemen, about marriage, which I believe are very important to have a Christ-honoring marriage. Number one of these six keys is maturity. Our goal within our counseling program is spiritual and emotional maturity. Okay, not acting like a child. Okay, uh, grow up. The Bible says here in verse uh, 15 that may grow up in him. So I have to grow up as a believer, as a Christian, in spiritual and emotional maturity. The second one is submission. I have to learn how 
to submit myself to God, so therefore I can submit myself to my husband or my wife, okay? And then uh, number three is love. We'll talk about that in the next session. Number four is communication, which we're talking about this morning. And number five is prayer. Number six is Christ, okay? Maturity, spiritual, emotional, submission, love, communication, prayer, and Christ. There's also some marriage killers that I'm going to talk about. Many of the marital problems today deal with in the areas of spiritual problems. We have many people who today who profess to be saved but have never really been born again. Now, 75% of all the people who are doubting their salvation, it's not because they're not saved. It's because they're not in fellowship with God. Okay? The other 25% really have never truly been born again. They, you know, they, know they, they may have said something with their mouth, but it wasn't from the heart. And you know, I, I, we dealt with a lady uh, this past week, and uh, she's been involved in a lot of different issues, unfortunately, with psychiatrists and different things, uh, and has some serious, serious issues as far as she is concerned. But I want you to understand this. Um, she, when I gave, I want to ask her. I asked her a question. I, went, I said, "Now, what we're going to do here is, we're going to determine." Romans eight nine says, "If you have not the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His." So what we're going to do is, we're going to determine if the Holy Spirit's in you or not. Because she was talking about, you know, demons and all kinds of things. So we're going to determine if the Holy Spirit's in you or not. You say you're saved. So here's what we're going to do. I'm on, I want you to pray and ask God to show you if the Holy Spirit's in you or not. Then I'm going to pray and ask God if the Holy Spirit, show you if the Holy Spirit's in you or not. And then you're going to tell me, yes or no. Now, 95% of the time, we get yes or no. Of course, if it's yes, then we know this is an out of fellowship with God issue, right? Amen? Okay. If it is a, if it is no, then we know they're not saved and they need to get saved, right? Okay. So instead of just saying, okay, we're just going to go through this now and we're going to have you pray again. Well, we've had people that prayed hundreds of times and they still don't know they're saved. And, you know, it's a sad scenario. So we want to end that. But a very interesting thing. She said, I didn't get any answer, which means she's not saved. It's no. So we went through that, and uh, she ended up getting saved. But the problem here is, is that, is that she was so focused on all these externals and things that were really ungodly. Now, I always tell people this, and I want you to hear me carefully. Think about a ship and the portal windows. You know, the little round windows? Now, if those little round windows are open, water gets in. They close them so that uh, water doesn't get in. Now, liken that to your life. If you open that portal window, and you allow Satan, and by the way, Satan does want to oppress you, okay, and you allow that to take place by being out of fellowship with God. Now, now think about this with me. Man's a trichotomy, body, soul, and spirit, okay? God works from the inside out. Satan works from the outside in. And he wants to do oppression in your life. So when you are out of fellowship with God, you open that, that portal. And then Satan is going to work on your soul, which is where the seat of your emotions are. In essence, so if he can control you emotionally, he'll control your decision making, and, or he'll control your will, and then he'll control your decision making. So... Now, most of the people that come into us for counseling for marriage, 
they're not friends. Okay, they're not even close to being friends. They don't, they don't, they don't like each other. Now, in my office at the church, I had a love seat. Now, do you understand? I had a love seat. It wasn't a couch. It was a love seat. And that was the only thing in there. I didn't have other chairs. I just had the love seat. I had a guy one time that came in and said, looked at the love seat, and he said, you mean I got to sit by her? And I said, well, did you say you loved her when you married her? Well, yeah. Well, then sit down. It's the only place in the room. Sit. And he says, well, if I knew I didn't have to do this, I wouldn't come to counseling. <laughs> Think about it. Sit beside his wife. Now, how does a person that says, you know, that I love you at, at a marriage altar get to the place where he says, I don't even want to sit by you? And then, of course, I've had the, you get the men say, you don't even know what it's like to live with her, preacher. And I've been her always, the wife always says it's this. I don't love him anymore. You know. So how do we get to that place? Well, one of the ways we get to that, you know, one of the ways we get to that place is how we communicate. Amen? Amen. How we communicate. And so uh, I, I, want you, I want you to understand that Many people who profess to be saved are doer mentality Christians who think that they're spiritual by what they do, but not what they be. Because if you be, you will do. In essence, I got to be a spirit controlled person. And if I don't understand that, I'm going to be doomed to being a doer mentality Christian who is going to fail on multiple different fronts of my life. Now, I know that this is a young church. What, five years old? Probably you've already had people that have come here and left and their life is in disaster. Correct? I mean, you know, it's going to happen. Why? Because they have chosen to be doer mentality people rather than spirit-controlled people. Everything in life is a choice. So they have chosen to be doer mentality Christians rather than be a spirit-controlled Christian. In essence, they want to slide through their Christian life and they want to uh, put on the appearance of being a godly person, but it's not there. Because they've never learned how to be a spirit-controlled person. <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure Pastor has preached about that. But the bottom line is, is that no one can do it for you. And we tell our counselees that. We can't do this for you. Uh, you know, I'd love to have a can opener and just take it and run around a person's head, pull it open, pour it in, then stitch it back up. And get it. But it doesn't work that way. We can't do it for you. We can give you the tools, God's tools, but we can't do it for you. You've got to make a choice in your life that you're not going to be a doer mentality Christian, but you're going to be a spirit-controlled person. Otherwise, you're going to fail. Now, <clears throat> These marriage killers, okay, are people that are that are they're they're focused in on being a doer mentality person, rather and, and in the power of the flesh rather than in the power of the spirit. The flesh always fails, and so the you know and so these marriage killers, uh, many of the marital problems today are spiritual problems, and we have many people today who profess to be saved. They've really not been born again. We also have many people who are saved but not living a spirit-controlled life. And, and there are always those that hear me that will immediately say, Dr. Coomer doesn't understand my situation. My situation is different. No, folks, I'll tell you what. I've been doing this for a long time. I understand. Believe me, I understand. 
many folks, when, when you talk in these areas, their first reaction is, it won't work, or he just doesn't understand. The real problem that I found is a willingness to apply the spiritual principles to their life. I don't have a magic wand here. I'm not going to slap you in the head and make you super Christian. It doesn't work that way. Now, I want to ask everybody in this room a serious question right now. Do you want your will or do you want to be conformed to his will and have a Christ honoring marriage? You want your will or you want to be conformed to his will? That's the story. That's the question. That's where it's at. Many folks today are accepting second or third rate principles in their marriage. They're unhappy, but they either do not understand what to do or they hear what to do and they rebel against it. And in essence, they make excuses for not having a good marriage. Now, communication is the main problem or a start of a problem in about 99% of marriages. In essence, Christians don't talk to one another, or a, or a man and a woman, they don't talk to each other, and they certainly don't talk about spiritual things in their lives. Now, they rarely talk about anything, yet young lovers rarely have a communication problem. They seem to be able to talk about anything, but somehow the ability often vanishes after they're married. And lack of communication is almost always a problem for those who come for counseling. And it's not the lack of communication, it's the wrong communication. Now look at verse 29. Now notice what it says. All right, what is the first word in this verse, folks? Let. When you see let at the start of a verse, it means somebody's got to make a decision. So whenever you see let at the start of a verse in the Bible, somebody's got to make a decision. So let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. No, none, nada. So what kind of a problem do we got with no? So you have to make a decision to let no corrupt communication Proceed out of your mouth. Now tomorrow morning we're going to give you tools, God's tools to help you control your thought life. Because generally everything starts right here and what, what is up here is going to come out of here. Eventually. God's tools to control your thought life. Do you realize that you can be out of fellowship with God by... Your thought life? What you're thinking about? You know, fantasy thinking? Now I want you to understand, you may think that nobody knows that. But I got news for you, God knows! You're not fooling God. And the reason why you're really struggling in your life or in your marriage is because of what you think and being out of fellowship with God and not understanding that that's a major malfunction. You know, the Bible says to bring every thought into captivity. And we can do that, by the way, using God's tools. Now, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And watch what the Bible says now. But that which is good to the use of what, folks? Edifying, building up, encouraging. That it may minister grace. And the word grace means divine help unto the hearers. Have you ever thought about ministering divine help to your wife? Divine help to your husband? Divine help to your children? <coughs> now notice in verse 31. Now what's the first word in verse 31, folks? Let. What's it mean? 
Got to make a decision. Let, okay, now watch. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now pay attention. Let all, what's the first word there? Bitterness. bitterness. Why do you think bitterness is there first? Okay, thought live. Bitterness is a root sin. All the other garbage in that verse comes off of that. Bitterness. Many times people fail in their life because they have a root of bitterness. Many of the children who go off and do not live for God have bitterness in their heart toward their mom and dad. Many wives have bitterness in their heart toward their husband. Many husbands have bitterness in their heart toward their wife. So one of the things that we ask our counselees to do every day is ask God three questions. But one of, one of God's tools is, is that you can ask Him questions. A question is submission. So we're to submit ourselves to God. Okay, so here, here it is. Think about it like this. Okay, God, I want you to show me, first of all, is there any sin in my life that stands between you and me? Every day. Every day. I want you to show me if there's any sin that stands between you and me. Make it real to me. And by the way, it'll pop into your mind. And then I confess that, 1 John 1, 9. Now most Christians, I don't want to get too technical here, but most Christians believe, well, if I ask God to forgive me for it, then that's done. I understand that. But the point being is this, you know, there are people that can ask God to forgive them for something. And, you know, let's say Pastor Knickerbocker preaches on something, and, you know, somebody here gets convicted about that, and the Holy Spirit convicts them about some need in their life and they come forward and they ask God to forgive them in 24, 36, 48 hours again, they're doing it again. Now that means that there is a demand lust in their life that's controlling behavior. And there's, lust, there's at least 82 different lusts that a Christian can have in their life. In Ephesians 2.3, a demand lust is a desire of the mind. It controls behavior. Everybody with me? Okay, think alcoholic. Okay? That would be something that we would get. But think about it like this, or moral. Most, most of the time when, when you talk to uh, people, Christians, about lust, the first thing that comes into their mind is moral. Well, moral's only one. There's 81 others. So, you know, if it comes up again and again and again, it's a demand lust, it's controlling behavior. And we have a change sheet and, one, and the worry, anxiety, and fear, and what should I do if I'm doubting my salvation? And it's got all 82 lusts that a Christian can have on a scale of 0 to 10. 0, 1, 2, 3, meaning it's not a problem. 4, 5, 6, it's getting to be a problem. 7, 8, 9, and 10, it's a demand lust, controlling behavior. Most Christians have at least three. Now, this is a major malfunction. Now, once we get a person up, generally speaking, once we get them up having a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God, and that they are applying the things that we're teaching them, 90% of their problems go away. The other 10% are in that category of demand lust. And we have to pick those off one at a time. And I'll talk about that, how we pick them off in a little and later. But I want you to understand this. 
99 and 9 tenths percent of independent Baptist people have no clue about what their lusts are. So therefore, they're walking blind. Understand me? And then we wonder why 80% of the children walk away. You know, I've, I've heard a lot of preaching in my life. I have four degrees. All earned. The hard way. <laughs> and I've heard a lot of preaching. My undergrad degree was, you know, I went to Tennessee Temple. Under Lee Roberts. And I heard a lot of preachers there. The, the best preachers supposedly of our era and time. And I've heard a lot of preaching say, now listen, don't be living like the world. But never explain, you know, in essence, what, the, what that means and how to deal with that. <clears throat> so what we get down to is how we're really going to deal with it. How we're going to use God's tool. How we're going to make... Biblical, long-term change in our life. what I just say? Biblical, long-term change. So, first question they ask is, <coughs> is there any sin that stands between you and me? And then I confess that. Secondly, is there any hurt I'm allowing to control me right now? Because hurt can easily become bitterness, right? Now, bitterness is a root sin. And when it gets into your heart, the Bible says that it defiles many. What is your name, sir? Mark? Okay, Mark. You want to help me for a second? All right. I had a young lady in a marriage conference uh, uh, several years ago, and I said, do you want to help me? No! I want to help. <laughs> no way. Okay. So Mark has stepped out here by faith. Amen. All right, now Mark, if I have bitterness in my heart, now how many children do you have? Four. Four. Do you know it defiles them? Everybody you come in contact with, if you've got bitterness in your heart, it defiles them. Understand? If you've got, if you've got more than, you know, if you've got a child, it's going to defile them. If you've got bitterness in your heart. It's going to defile your husband. It's going to defile your wife. It's going to defile everybody you come in contact with. I, you know, one of, the th one of the biggest problems I see today is we just wrote a new booklet called Do You Have a Critical Spirit? The sin that hurts. Just in Florida, and a pastor, young pastor, picks the booklet up and looks at it, looks at me, and he says, Really needed. And we already sold out of the thing twice. This is a major malfunction. Critical spirit. But the really thing behind that critical spirit is what? Bitterness. You know, so in essence, you know, someone hurts someone and, you know, because of their critical spirit and, you know, and of course, you know, and, and you know how I can tell, one of the ways you can tell if you've got a critical spirit is that somebody mentions the name of somebody and you have bitterness in your heart toward them. And you know, the first thing that comes to your mind is, oh, you don't really know them. And then you say something derogatory about them. Bitterness defiles. And it's a root sin that gets in your heart. And it causes you 
to see everything differently. <coughs> so now, watch what else it says. And remember, we're talking about communication. So if I have bitterness toward my wife, is that going to mess with my communication with her? Amen? Amen. A woman? <laughs> Something, okay? It's going to mess with my communication with her. Or if she has bitterness in her heart, it's going to mess with her communication with me. I always tell people that never and always are always an exaggeration. You know, the wife says, you never do this. Or you always do that. It's always an exaggeration. <coughs> but the husband does the same thing, by the way. But in building a relationship, I can't have bitterness in my heart. So every day I'm going to have to ask God. Now listen carefully to me. Everybody focus with me right now. Don't miss this. For bitterness, since it's a root sin, Jeremiah 17, 9 says that our heart is desperately wicked. And who can know it? You can't know your own heart. Okay? And then Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, God, search the heart. All right, so I'm going to ask God every day to search my heart to see if there's any bitterness. 1 Corinthians 2.10 says the Holy Spirit is the one who does the searching and the revealing. So I'm going to ask God to search my heart to show me if there's any bitterness in my heart. And if He does show that to me, then I'm going to confess in His sin. But I want you to listen to me now carefully. That's, that's still not going to get it. Because since this is a root sin, I'm going to have, Mark, I'm going to have to ask God to take it out of my heart. Got it? Everybody hearing me? Okay, so in essence, I'm going to do spiritual house cleaning every day. Okay, every day. So, now, okay, Mark. If you didn't take a bath this week, how'd your wife feel about that? <laughs> That's a good word. Okay. So what happens if you didn't take one for two weeks? Extremely disgusted? Probably some social distancing? Now, by the way, if everybody came in here and they hadn't taken a bath in two weeks, we'd have a lot of social distancing in here. Okay? We wouldn't have to worry about six feet apart. Okay? The whole point of it is, think about it like that. So if you would not take a bath for two weeks, but what, a, what about spiritually taking one? Just like you would take a bath or a shower on a, you know, a daily basis, you want to be spiritually clean every day so that you can communicate properly. Amen? Because the, the, the lack of communication or wrong kind of communication is a starter of a problem or a problem in 99% of marriages. But it really goes back to bitterness, doesn't it? Now watch what else, watch what else comes off of bitterness. Okay? And it says, and wrath. You know, wrath is anger with a strong desire to avenge. And anger, just flat being mad. And clamor. Do you know clamor is, pub, that means public quarreling. Okay. How many of you have got more than one child? You got one child or more? Okay. So you and your wife are arguing. That's called public clamoring or public quarreling because their children are around.
I went to a home of, of one of our church members who, um, I was driving, uh, going out of town, and they lived down in a subdivision on the outskirts of town. So I stopped in, and uh, I was, the Lord had just spoke to my heart, I really needed to stop by there. So I stopped by, knocked on the, knocked on the uh, door, and the 12-year-old son came to the door, and I heard, I heard, boy, just some real, you know, bad talking going on in the background. And the son came to the door and looked at me and he said, 12 years old, he said, Pastor, I wish they would just stop. I wish they would just stop. So I walked in and he's on the phone with her. And, you know, and there he's yelling. And he looks at me and he says, puts his hand on the phone, he says, you see what I got to deal with? Now, she, she was our church pianist. At church, very sweet. Very kind. You would have never, ever thought that. So he handed me the phone. So I put it up to my ear and I'm listening and I heard words that should never come out of a Christian's mouth. So I called her by name and she says, oh, pastor, how are you? I said, well, I'm doing all right, but it doesn't sound like you're doing too good. That 12-year-old boy ended up being a drug runner. Arrested, put to jail. Daughters involved in immorality, one of them being a person who is involved in extreme immorality. Divorced. And everything we tried to do was rejected. Very sad, very sad. But just remember, God had spoke to my heart as I was going by, you need to stop here. So the outward appearance doesn't always show what a person is. The outward appearance does not always show. And if I'm a person who's out of fellowship with God, and not being a spirit-controlled person, I'm going to have bitterness in my heart, and therefore I'm going to be a person who is going to create havoc for my family. And my church family. Bitterness. And all these things. So, and notice it says, and evil speaking be put away from who? You. And notice it says with all malice. We'll look at it like this, ladies and gentlemen. If, I call these things here the slimy six. So if you're doing all of these, you're going to be a malicious person. You're going to be a malicious person. Now God said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying and he said, all of these things got to be put away. Now look at the kind of communication that God wants. Look at verse 32. And be ye what, folks? Come on, help me out. Kind one to another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. 
Now, by the way, if you're in verse 29 or you're in verse 31, look at what you're doing in verse 30. And grieve not who? Holy Spirit. Whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. You know what the word grieve means? Hurt. So the moment you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you. And when you handle yourself this way, when you've got bitterness in your heart, you're not going to communicate properly. When you have sin in your life between you and God, you're not going to communicate properly. And you're going to hurt the Holy Spirit. You're going to grieve Him. And your communication is going to be poor. And so therefore, what's going to transpire is a lot of hurt. You know, years ago in our church, uh, I'm, these, these two people, I'm going to give names, but that's not their real name, uh, for the purpose of privacy. Keith and Darlene came from marriage counseling. He worked all kinds of shifts. She works during the day. Each of them had several extracurricular activities. They only saw each other in passing, and they never talked. And when they did talk, they argued. As they sat across from me in my office, the first thing she said was, I do not love him. It did not take me too long to realize that they didn't really know each other. And I said, okay, darling, tell me the things that bother you about Keith. She went on for 20 minutes without coming up for air. And it went back to six months after they were married. And since there are two sides to every argument, I said, Keith, tell me what bothers you about Darlene. He took off for 20 minutes. They'd been married 10 years. And he asked her why she didn't tell him these things. And she stated she was afraid he would get mad. And she asked him why he did not tell her these things. And his answer was she'd go into the silent treatment. Now, three ways that people show that they're not spirit-controlled people, okay? And that communication is always going to be an issue. Now, the real weakness of the church today is a lack of spiritual families and leaders and a person who's out of fellowship with God and trying to do the work of God in his or her own power is heading for a disaster. And they're capable of all the sins of Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Okay? They're capable of all of them. They're capable of doing all of them. Now, if we live in the Spirit, the Bible says, let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen? And, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the statistics are staggering. And yet, whole chapters of the Bible are dedicated to this, and God even devoted the whole book of Proverbs to it. And the statistics for, for leaders' children are staggering, too. The three communication killers. I want to do these and then we'll stop, okay? Three communication killers. I, I want you there. The, how does the wall of resistance to communication gradually build up between two people that love each other? There are three weapons that people use to defend themselves. And as we look at these three weapons, we'll find out by, that by using them, married people gradually build a wall of resistance so they're no longer able to communicate. In essence, what is taking place at each time an incident happens, another brick gets put on the wall. Another brick gets put on the wall. Another brick gets put on the wall. Another brick gets put on the wall until they eventually can't get over the wall. Got it? It's too high. They can't get over it. So the first one is explosion. Now, uh, whenever a person uh, as we look at these, just as we look at these three weapons, you'll find that by using them, married people gradually build a wall of resistance, so they're no longer able to communicate. You know, it's always interesting. You know, we've had many young girls in our churches and the counseling. Um, in our first church, we had sixteen. Or no, we had twenty. Uh, it was twenty girls between the ages of sixteen and twenty. This is a church plant. So we had 20 girls between the ages of 16 and 20. So I decided to preach a message on how to get a husband. They all sat in the first two or three rows, had pads out, you know, just writing, you know, writing down every word you said. We had two boys in the church. 
So one of my friends came who was single, and we happened to mention that he was coming, and he was single. One of the girls said, Pastor, do you think that uh, we could just have some kind of a get-together and have him come over, and, you know? And we'd have couples there and other things. So I don't see a problem with that, you know. I'm going to find out it was all 20 girls and him. I had pizza. He comes back and he says, you set that up, didn't you? I said, what? He said, I was in there with 20 girls by myself. Hunting, you know, hunting, hunting for a husband, okay? He eventually did get buried, by the way, but not to any of them. All right? Now, as we look at these three weapons, you're going to find that by using them, the people gradually build that wall. The first one is explosion. So listen to me carefully. Whenever a person is told his or her shortcomings, rather than face them honestly, their natural reaction is to what? Explode. And this explosion is the result of inner anger and hostility that causes them to attempt self-protection. Ephesians 4.31. Okay? Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with mal malice. When someone, particularly our partner, points out our weaknesses and we tend to grasp for something to cover us, what does, th what, what, what does this, what this does is teach our partner that you can't come cl that close to my intimate weaknesses and if you do, I'll explode. Number two, tears. Tears is basically used by women. Like other weapons, it's a way of saying to your partner, don't tell me my shortcomings or I will cry. Now, so another brick, and by the way, I don't get that I don't think people ought not to cry, but, so, but in this particular instance, we're, not, we're crying for the wrong reason. So an, another brick is laid in the wall that stifles communication. And men, you need to learn to distinguish between your wife's tears of emotion, stress, joy, and self-pity. Now women are far more intricate creatures and often show their emotions through tears. Don't despise your wife's tears. Be patient, kind, for the emotional creature you're married is just being a woman. And, I, and now listen, I'm far from being an expert on feminine matters, but you know, I just want you to understand that that's, uh, women are made up differently than we are, guys. Uh, then the third one is silence. And silence is the weapon, Mark, that is used by many older Christians. Okay, they learn to use it because it doesn't take too long to realize it's not Christian to get mad and explode all over the place. And when our partner crosses us or points out our weaknesses, so we resort to silence. However, that is a dangerous tool <clears throat> because silence is, is caused by anger. And when it goes on for long periods of time, it causes real communication problems. <clears throat> now, first, Galatians 5.16 says this. This I say, then walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, what is the answer? Right there. Turn back there to Galatians chapter 5 and look at verse 16. And we're going to be done. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see it? <clears throat> Do you see the verse? So the answer is, walk in the what? Spirit. Spirit. So, if I'm exploding all over the countryside, am I walking in the Spirit? Okay, if I am, if I am uh, all the time crying, am I walking in the Spirit? Now, if I'm going around and I don't talk to my wife or my husband for three days, am I walking in the Spirit? No. And yet, many Christians do that. The Christian is not walking in the Spirit. They're fulfilling the lust of the flesh. 
and it's leading to disaster in their marriage and in their children. So communication becomes a big deal. And I need to learn how to communicate properly. Let's have a word of prayer.